Best Book Bits podcast brings you Louise Thompson, a master coach and well-being strategist that helps smart, busy women genuinely move the needle on their mental and physical well-being, transforming good intentions into consistent, healthy habits. She's the author of High Energy Happiness, a newspaper columnist, former New Zealand Herald and TV and radio guest expert on all things bean. Louise, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. No worries. Now, your story is quite unique. You always weren't the healthy, well-being person that you teach others to be. Can you go back and tell us your story, how you started in this field and became sick? Yeah, sure. So I'd like to think that I, I, I trod the path that I don't want anyone else to go down, and that's why I now do what I do. But I did, I did what I think probably a lot of people do in busy corporate jobs. I used to work in I call big media, so newspapers, and had a great career in London and then in Auckland, working for national newspapers, worked hard, played harder, and had an amazing time. But over the course of oh, 15 years or so, just gradually started to completely burn myself out to a point where I actually ended up bedridden <laughs> for four months and I couldn't work for over a year and it was a pretty sobering, terrifying thing to happen but what was more terrifying about it was that it wasn't an illness that I'd caught. I hadn't got some sort of cancer or some sort of horrifying illness. I was bedridden but the, the fact was this it was so severe I'd done it to myself with a million tiny choices over the years to prioritise work and drinking and more work and so on over tiny choices that would have improved my mental health and my physical health. And I'd essentially done it to myself. And I know I'm not alone in that. And since I've written my books and so on, so many people get in touch and say, I've read your story and oh my God, I can see so much of myself in that because it's so easily done when you're in those sorts of environments or not even in those sorts of environments. I've worked with loads of stay at home mums who are doing it all to a super high level. Those sort of perfectionist tendencies, you don't have to be in corporate to have them. You can be in any kind of job, career, circumstance but the physical and mental outcomes can be really pretty serious. Yeah, so essentially you had your foot on the gas with work, hours, diet, stress, alcohol, socializing, I'm just guessing by the way, and foot to the floor, career, money, lifestyle, social things, and then one day the body just packs it up and say, hey, I'm officially burnt out and I'm going to put a physical rest to you. How did you start to get better? What was the process and thoughts behind that? What did you do? How did you get better? It was a really strange one, really, because I think, and this is, again, what I hear from people when they read the book or they read about my story, they're like, oh my God, this is me. They keep going to the doctor. Obviously, you don't suddenly get bedridden ill with chronic fatigue syndrome. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of years to get yourself to that point. And over that period of time, you're starting to think, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm really struggling to get up in the morning, or I'm really wise and I can't sleep, or I absolutely need coffee in order to be able to function, or I feel a bit dizzy when I stand up, or I've got a headache quite often these days, or there's all these little things which over time, start increasing and you go to the doctor and you say, I'm not quite feeling myself. I feel really run down. I'm getting every bug that's going. And essentially it took years for me to get that ill, but I went to the doctors, I can't tell you how many times, and they would do blood tests and everything would be normal. And so I'd just have another trim flat white and <laughs> rock on with my life until the point where I absolutely couldn't. When I ended up bedridden, like my blood pressure was 80 over 49, which even the doctor was like, you shouldn't even be moving around. This is not okay. My hair was falling out in just, I was so unwell, but all the blood tests were showing that I was normal. 
And that is the frustration. If you get chronic fatigue syndrome, severe adrenal fatigue, which is what I had, it doesn't show in the standard way that we do blood tests. So it's a, it's a real frustration because something's not right, but quite often, and I hear from my clients so on, they just get offered antidepressants and told to crack on really. And it is depressing having no energy but it's not depression. It's a very depressing circumstance, but it's not come from depression. It's come from a problem with essentially the way that your body is managing energy. And so getting better was very tricky because it's very hard to get a diagnosis. And it was very hard because you're collapsed. I was collapsed in bed, but yet still the medical profession was saying can't find anything technically there's nothing wrong with you are you sure it's not all in your mind when you're like i'm normally like i live a big full like what this is not all in my head there's something seriously wrong and so for me starting to get better was i came across because you start reaching out everywhere natural medicine all of it because of the desperation and i came across the work of a doctor called dr james wilson who is an incredible doctor in the states and he coined the term adrenal fatigue many years ago because he was seeing lots of high achievers essentially burning out and testing negative for everything and not getting any support and he has a comprehensive 140 question questionnaire of all these little symptoms when you add them together the big picture is you've got complete adrenal exhaustion and i did this questionnaire and i got so pretty much the highest score anyone's ever got and started following his work and getting these supplements that he provides and i was so sick michael you won't believe this they come in three jars right i was so ill i couldn't have the energy to open and you take them three times a day open and close the jars i was i couldn't it was i couldn't even hold my own head up and sit upright i was just completely horizontal all the time i couldn't hold my when i resigned from my job the ceo came to my house and i resigned from the sofa they were so good we'll keep your job open whatever you want and i was like no i don't think i can come back i couldn't even have my head upright on my neck it's it's a catastrophic level of tiredness it's very hard to really describe and so getting better was a finding the work of dr james wilson who's incredible and then secondly at the same time as i was doing my big corporate career i also had launched my own yoga business and i was training to be a life coach because i already had a psych degree and i was really interested or whatever so i would be in corporate all day and then i'd drive home and then i'd quickly get changed into my lululemons and then at six o'clock i'd be teaching 36 people yoga and then at the weekends i'd be doing my life coach training and so it's amazing how i burned out right but doing my coach training and listening to the audios at that, those times, I was just like, Do you know what? I am going to get better from this. I'm not going to manage this condition, which is what people say. You've got to learn to manage it. I'm going to get better. And then I am going to write a book about it so that other people do not have to go through this. Because this was avoidable for me. This was preventable. And it was essentially, it was all mental health management basic mental health management that I've been too busy living my life to actually consistently put in place for myself. And I paid a very big price. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy story. And sometimes the worst things that happen to us are the catalyst for our next stage in life and our next career. And now we become that teacher because of the experiences that we've had as well. Talk to me about the book. So I've got the book here. Thank you for sending me a copy, The Busy Woman's Guide to High Energy Happiness. How long did it take you to write the book and when did it come out? It came out, oh, it must be about 10 years ago now. And it, it took a while to write the book. And I was very conscious that I didn't want it to be a book that people just read. I wanted it to be a book that people used and that people did so that it's very much a workbook. So if you, there's a big thing I think in the self-help sphere where people are giving loads and loads of information. And the thing is with information, we go, oh yeah, that's interesting, oh that's me. And then we do nothing with that information. In which case we are 0% further forward. 
I wanted my book to be focused on not just that information, but taking that awareness and then implementing it, doing something with that knowledge. Because unless you do that, you don't turn it around. So it's got lots of spaces that you fill in your own answers. I'm asking a lot of questions of people. It's quite deep work, really, because you have to look yourself in the face if you're being honest about creating it for yourself and you want to uncreate it. So it's very much a workbook. It starts with seven stages of fatigue which we've actually got a freebie on. I can send you the link if your people would like it, where you can sort of grade, oh, I think I'm stage three out of stage seven. Oh my God, okay, good to know. I can turn that around because I don't want it to get down to stage seven. Seven is bedridden, right? So we start with that so that people can really check in and, and see where they sit and then the rest of the book obviously I talk about my story but then it's it's chapters that are they're very action based it's okay is this a thinking style perhaps you're a perfectionist it manifests in this way here's a different way to start approaching a small thing in life and doing it differently is this a pattern for you oh it is okay cool here's a tool that you can use to start turning that around is this a way you genuine generally beat yourself up in your own head or you're really judgmental with yourself or with others or whatever or if you're highly critical of yourself this is how you can start turning that around so it's very action oriented and it, it steps people around from the reality check i guess at the beginning because people are only going to pick that book up if they're thinking do you know what i really do feel more knackered than I think is normal. How tired am I and is this normal and what can I do about it? And they're probably picking it up after they've been to the doctors a few times and got nowhere. So it's very much about guiding people on turning it around with far more sensibleness than I did for myself. And I was very lucky, I wrote it actually reasonably quickly because like I said, I decided when I was sick, this must have happened so I can write a this book so that other people don't have to go through this and and then I was very lucky Penguin called me whilst I was writing it because I was doing my column for the New Zealand Herald at the time and they just said hey look we love your columns would you be interested in writing a book and I was like that's really weird I've nearly finished writing one actually and they were oh that's very cool bring it in and so it was easy as that really and they were fabulous people to work with and it was great to get that story into the hands of people and thousands of people that that need that help and I, I get amazing emails and stuff even though it's 10 years old that book I get amazing emails every week from people saying I just someone recommended it to me or I and I see so much of myself in it and I'm taking a, the steps that that you'll say it's really given me a wake-up call yeah that's that's a really cool story not every day that a first time author's halfway through their book and Penguin Random House just gives them a call and say hey do you want to write a book and you're like hey I've actually only finished one so that's doesn't happen to us all so congratulations on that but it, it's funny that you can look back and connect the dots and your previous career turns into the stepping stone for your next career as well. One of the biggest topics of the book, which is obviously highlighted bold, it's called high energy. I was having a conversation recently with another author about energy and it's one of the biggest currencies that isn't spoken about. People talk about time, money, emotion, but energy is really the currency people are paying for. I've got to get my sleep because I will need to have energy for tomorrow. I need to go on holiday so I can recharge and get energy and do fun things. It's such a massive thing in our whole life. It's revolved around energy. I recently had a personal experience where I started to experiment with different things, got off alcohol for over a year, had great energy, recently got back on it to test it, realized it wasn't in line with my energy, felt low. And I was like, you know what? Doesn't work out well. Rather do the gym than drink alcohol. So energy high energy is such a massive topic that it's a huge currency that we all live by as well yeah it's the most undervalued currency of modern life the most undervalued currency of modern life in the book you talk about mind which we know body spirit and high energy why does high energy come after spirit i don't know i mean i think energy is something that runs through it runs through everything and it's something that we only value when we don't have it and that was certainly my learning and my experience and now it's something that I value more highly like you say it's more valuable than your money and your time if you've got no energy nothing works I probably in the last decade it developed on from the way things are in that book to the next level I guess and so my work now is very much around four pillars which I call four dimensional wellness that's strong body fierce mind kind heart 
and a brave spirit and it's putting those four elements together is so in my coaching academy we work on a module that's one of those four areas each time because i think you know, life has changed a lot in 10 years right hasn't it you look at the way social media has changed our landscape in the last 10 years and you see a lot of people who maybe on instagram they look absolutely perfect but a lot of them on the inside deeply unhappy so if you don't have a fierce mind and those mental health practices you don't have a peaceful heart where you're able to process your emotions and be in a truthful pace with yourself and the world if you're not doing those spiritual alignment things then what is that physical fitness worth really it's so if you it's those four elements i believe and that's where like i say in the academy that's what we teach every single day it's tools on aligning those four elements of health and i believe we need all four mental emotional and spiritual and when we are making small conscious efforts on those four paradigms of, of four dimensional wellness each day each week then that's when we are living high high energy happy essentially because we're caretaking it's not just physical energy that's important, but it's our spiritual energy, our emotional energy and our mental energy. It's having all four of those aligned. Yeah, absolutely. I have recently had a personal experience. So I had a, a great coach, like uh, the personal trainer, who's also an osteo. I interviewed him as well. Great guy. Fantastic. I went in there with one injury. He's my wife's PT. I walked out with four injuries, like four or five months later. He put me on a, not a hard program, but I was lifting very heavy. I was doing some great stuff, but it wasn't aligned with my energy levels at the time and my pace and so i've been struggling with some injuries lately and i'm still struggling with them so recently we just i put a pause to it because i wanted to do my own program my own time i wanted to incorporate maybe some more breath work instead of weights cardio yoga just walking the dog instead of a high weightlifting thing and this is what i'm getting to sometimes you need to be your own coach and sometimes you know your own answers and instead of looking for the answers or paying for someone else's answers sometimes you just need to sit in silence journal realize what you're not doing instead of what you are doing so it's not about doing sometimes it's about stop the doing and let your body recover and rest prioritize sleep i want to read something here that you wrote in the book you talk about 10 truth flashes of high energy happiness and you learn some fundamental truths while you recovered your own energy and you would still be crying into your triple strength nespresso so here's some of the shortcut 10 truths so number one You've got to prioritize your energy levels. How important is it to prioritize the energy levels and where do some of your clients go wrong? Or that's, it's, yeah, if you want to jam on number one, then I'll talk about the rest really quickly as well. So prioritize the energy levels. I think it, it links into to what you were saying before about energy being currency and a really powerful, important human currency. And that people, because it, it doesn't get talked about, although obviously, I'm on a personal mission to change that. It's not one of the, the currencies that we talk about. People don't think they have to prioritize it. And I think, like you say, as we get older as well, we don't want to maybe lift as heavy in the gym. We do want to have more yoga and other practices. Like when we're in our 20s and we are living a high octane life and we're drinking and we're burning the candle at both ends and we still have energy we take it for granted we don't we feel like we don't need an energy management practice because our energy is just there but as we move through life and life stages change and people have children and obviously there's a real energy requirement there and parents age and th there's energy required there so it's i think it overall it's the fact that we generally we don't actually consider what we need that keeping our energy high is important until we don't have it. And it's only when we don't have it that people are pushed into a crisis of doing something about it. And I'd also say, secondly, culturally, where most people go wrong is, and we have lived in the last sort of 20 years or so in this extreme coffee culture. And I can't wait till I'm back in New Zealand. No one does a flat white. Oh my God, the Aussies are the Kiwis the best coffee in the world hands down but we have such a strong coffee culture that we've almost got to the point where if we're tired we don't go hmm my body feels quite tired maybe i need to rest a bit more maybe i'll go to bed early tonight maybe i need to actually just when did i last have a holiday or have a break maybe i'm answering my emails late at night maybe there's something for me to think about because my body is tired therefore it needs it's a message from my body saying i need something because i'm tired we don't do that at all. We just go, my body is tired. I must need a double flat white. I will go and get one. And 
we, if anyone says they're tired, you just say, oh, would you like a coffee? And we've bypassed the really important message from our body and our soul, because we can be energetically tired and emotionally tired, not just physically tired. And we've bypassed all of that by saying, that's all right. I'll get you a latte. We don't take energy seriously, I think, is the until we don't have it. That's the big answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. so it's funny that like we all have the internet banking app on our phone. We always make sure that we pay the bills on time, that we do the groceries, have food in the house. But do we ever check in with our energy levels? It's be interesting in the future when all the when we're all connected to the internet of things and and we can actually check in with our energy balances through an app but sometimes we don't need an app we just need to listen to our bodies as well your body's an amazing miracle it's a healing machine if you create the conditions it will heal that's truth flash number two and number three you we have to think differently as well thinking differently zero tolerance zero tolerance policy for whinging moaning and generally feeling sorry for yourself consistency is huge as well and making sure that your emotional states are high priority as well so Great things through there as well. And you talk the last one, outrageous energy is available to us. We've all had times where we've had amazing energy and we feel great. And that I think that's what ties into what you said, high energy happiness, because having high energy is happiness. And unfortunately, a lot of people take the shortcut and take drugs, whether it be alcohol, smoking, whatever it is to get that high energy that rush of high energy coffee as well then they feel happy because they're perked up so happiness and energy i believe are highly related low energy depression high energy happiness people know this very simple yeah awesome stuff thank you for sharing that in the book as well we will touch on the other book that you wrote as well soon which is a 101 self care ideas which is really cool too what's some of the other stuff in the book so understanding energy and fatigue obviously hand in hand how did you get into then from writing the book to coaching clients and doing the wellness stuff? So can you talk us through that journey through there as well? Yeah, again, it was a sort of, I don't know, I've been very lucky on this second career, I have to say, Michael. It's just, it really is all just unfolded pretty easily all, all by itself almost. Like once I'd got, I finished my coaching qualification, I'd left corporate and I had my yoga business and I just put out, okay, I've, I've qualified as a coach, I've got my site degree, this is the sort of area of work that I'm working in. And, and I know a lot of people, they really, obviously really struggle building their business as a coach and, and there's loads of great programs that can help people do that. But I have to say, in all honesty, literally from day one, I've had a queue of people to work with, in all honesty. And so it's been a really rewarding journey to do that and to be able to give people the tools that because it's not about being like, you work with me forever. It's you work with me for a short period of time. I'll teach you these tools. We'll get to the nub of your patterns. What's your thing? And then you know what you need to, to do to then they're off. It's not like they work with me forever. It's about that implemented knowledge over a set period of time. And then for me, just because the coaching business was just so busy so quickly and there's only one of me that's when i created my coaching academy which was back in 2015 now i know right before people everyone's doing a membership these days <laughs> right who hasn't got one but i launched mine in 2015 so the wellbeing warriors coaching academy so that i could work with hundreds and hundreds of people every day coaching tools we laugh a lot as well community but doing that that resourced tool-based coaching on those four dimensions physical mental emotional spiritual in a community that meant that i could just work with more people and i've got just the most amazing women in there and yeah we do a new module of on a different aspect of health every single month and a daily tiny daily implemented challenge so in the month you get your drop of resources but then each day you get a tiny challenge two minutes or less because everyone's busy to implement what you've learned and it's it's you get the acceleration of being in obviously a group of people all on the same path and with similar values to you and, and sharing an insight you learn from other people's insight but you people with a topic on the first of the month and then you see where they are on the 30th of the month and it is amazing actually when we're paying attention and we're implementing what we learn how much you can actually move the needle on your own mental health physical spiritual emotional health in 30 days so the whole coaching journey for me again i've just been quite i've been very hashtag blessed in in that department that it, it just unfolded pretty naturally all by its all by itself and i've been privileged to work with so many amazing people yeah very cool 
It's great. We all need a break in life and sometimes we all need to come out of the gates and have success straight away because that's going to propel the longevity of it as well. There's so many times that you get new coaches or people that tr try a career change and they have that micro failure and they really don't persist through it and they give up and they're exceptional teachers and it, you know how many great teachers that stopped teaching or gave up because they didn't have that early success as well. So c congrats on that. It just shows the power of group and the tribe as well. So when you start talking your own truth and your own story and you know you're teaching from life experience and you start doing something full time and giving it a go you're going to attract that tribe as well and if you're suffering there's so many people out there suffering as well if you fix yourself for a solution there's so many other people out there that you can help with that same solution as well and then talking to other people that just creates an environment of new learning i'm sure you're learning every day from your tribe and community as much as you're teaching them as well which is great one little thing in the book you talk about the seven stages of fatigue this was really interesting so stage one was situational normal which is normal number one is inspired so when we get inspired we get that little tinge of energy and it's like that new that work event thing so we get that social thing so we're at stage one we're inspired stage two we're wired i'm normally in the wired category most of the time and then stage three pushing through and bouncing back i like stage four so hauling ass so just getting after it everything's so it's, i think you said fucking effort which is true five is breaking down six is bedridden what is number seven? Oh, so it's the, so if you look at zero it actually makes seven altogether yeah looking back i would have numbered them differently i have to say that's one of the things you know about writing a book and then it's there forever isn't it you can't go back and renumber but because i called one of them zero because you're not actually in fatigue do you see what i mean so there are seven yeah that's right that's sorry i thought so okay got it saying i interviewed a guy a couple of years ago he's a top australian sales guy and he said he worked like five years straight never took a holiday break and then he went on holidays and he was at the breakfast thing and he passed out like he just had full passed out like his body just shut down and he said it was one of the most scariest experiences and just talking about breaking down and bedridden continue i just had to get that story out it's such a great story and sadly it's not un it's not uncommon and so it's such a great share because it's we are built as humans we've got this incredible nervous system and chemical cascade where we can push effort for events and for projects and, and in crisis and emergencies but also exciting things and we're built to be able to release that burst of energy and do those things but we are not it was still cavemen and women at the end of the day we're not hardwired to do that for five years without a break there is a consequence to that decision which is actually to have done that for what 1500 days 1600 days in a row that think of all the micro choices that he could have done differently to have ended up not in that position but i did essentially exactly what he did but just a little bit less dramatically one day i just went like that on my desk and my head hit the desk at work and my pa put me in a taxi and i went home and i went to bed and i didn't get out for four months listen to a podcast today by kerwin ray and he's the big australian social media guy and he's interviewed great people and he's quite successful in what he's done and the last two years he went through some massive internal changes and literally pretty much got really suicidal to the point where you like people change and people go through they can happen to anyone um on the surface things are looking great but internally things need to be things need to be worked out that your body keeps score and it doesn't forget as well you talk about the nervous system and this is i want to hear it from you a sympathetic nervous system parasympathetic nervous system fight or flight rest and digest light switch on light switch off i just had three months off recently as well as a break and i can tell you from a nervous system point of view i was all in parasymp parasympathetic nervous system i was resting and digesting i was reading books speaking to authors like yourself had a great time now i'm back at work and i can see the nervous system sympathetic nervous system shooting up and now I'm managing the nervous system but yeah what's your take on that with the sympathetic and parasympathetic parasymp nervous system yeah. we're built with this incredibly sophisticated nervous system which again it was built for cavemen and women but now you fast forward to life in 2023 and it's dealing with not us running away from a tiger and needing to release adrenaline but if we're getting anxious every time we go oh it's an email from my boss oh what's that text oh my god oh i haven't got back to so and so oh and that release and we're living in an almost permanent state of fight or flight we have not got the chemical capacity 
to do that for the long term and then you do end up with the situation like your friend at the breakfast buffet and like myself and I don't know I didn't know about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system and that I essentially had pushed myself to the point where I had it sympathetic on 100% of the time or 95% of the time when it's supposed to be on about 2% of the time and I didn't under I didn't understand that actually there are mental health techniques where we can start to dial down our stress and put ourselves back into a place of parasympathetic dominance but there's also simple physical techniques like you were talking earlier Michael about breathing and yoga and having more time in your life to incorporate those in because you're actually like, these are more important perhaps and more impactful than I perhaps appreciated before interesting good learning yeah self-regulation sometimes you need to self-regulate and say you know what that regulation system worked for me in the past where lifting weights was great, but very, very adrenal. Again, getting the adrenals up, getting that pump on. I'm like, maybe I don't need that. Maybe I just need that chill. And I just remember those moments of after a yoga session or after a breathwork session, I felt decompressed. And maybe I like, this is where it comes to self-coaching as well. It's very important sometimes. But yeah, continue. Sorry for cutting you off. Oh, no, you're not cutting me off at all. It's such a great discussion. Mm -hmm. It's, so it's when we, and that's why the, description in the book is i make it very simple like it is like you, you can't be in both at the same time you can't be in rest and digest and in fight or flight it's one or the other it's like a light switch and so if people can really just start being aware is it on is it off and when it's permanently on it is bad for me hands down so how do i what are the mechanisms for me to flick that switch off which are the ones that i can do in the moment when you're in the office and you realize you're really amped up and you're bringing that amped up energy to the people around you to your clients and customers to and to your own physiology what switches you back into parasympathetic dominance figure that out for yourself what is the balance of your life like you say are you doing loads of high octane stuff in the gym but not balancing that i'm a bit of a gym bunny myself i love it but you know, there's too much of a good thing right so it's finding that balance okay my body's going to find this quite stimulating because I'm lifting things that are heavy but there's a balance that I know I'm going to yoga tomorrow and I'm giving my body something different I think it's really honestly all about awareness and also about finding different ways for ourselves that switch it on and off and asking ourselves that question you know even recently, I've been working, staring at the computer screen all day, and at lunchtime, just packing, even if I'm out in the office, pack the shoes in the car and go for a 30-minute walk at lunch to get some air and just some movement, and you feel so much better just in terms of mood. This ties us on to our next one. So your book is, it's huge, 250 pages of small print. Definitely read it with a pen. I like that because my first book, Success for 50 Steps, it's all about notes, and you have to read it with a pen. So that's one thing I like about your book as well. So I want to go on to your second book, which is a digital book called 101 self-care ideas that are not drink more water or have another damn bubble bath your step-by-step -step guide to 101 simple self-care moves that really make a difference to your mind your body and your life by louise thompson that's a great little intro there talk to me about the 101 self-care ideas when did you put that together and yeah it's a great little ebook oh uh, thank you so i wrote that actually in lockdown so that's a pandemic book i think a lot of us have got a pandemic <laughs> Pandemic. There should be a, there should be an aisle at the bookshop and be like written during the pandemic. So it's like just a yeah. Yes, I love that. That would be a great podcast series almost on, on its own right, wouldn't it? Pandemic, pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Pandemic. <laughs> yes, I wrote it in 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 lockdown. Obviously, you have that little bit more time, don't you? And it was in response really to to Instagram. If I'm honest with you, I just I just reached this point of just really being sick of particularly as women, but I think just generally everybody that with the well-being and self-care advice sometimes it's just so surface level and so obvious and just, oh, you stress women, go and have a bubble bath and you'll feel better. The amount of times you see it, it's just crazy making and influencers just saying i look like this because i drink loads of water every day so make sure you drink your three liters or whatever and it's like sure drink more water but it's not really that not really self-care advice that's just basic survival and we've got a mechanism for that and it's called thirst and if you're thirsty, drink some water what self-care and then the other thing is just have a spa day if people are a bit stressed just have a spa day 
and I was actually at the spa yesterday. Love a spa. Oh my god, it's fantastic, but it's actually not. It's an indulgence, right? If you turn up to the spa and you are your mental health is not good, you're really worried about a million things in your life, you're spiritually unaligned with whether it's your relationship, your work, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time in your life, and you know, someone's there giving you a massage, you will feel good in those 60 minutes in that moment. It's an indulgence. Genuine self-care is booking a meeting with your boss to say, hey, do you know what? My workload's unsustainable. We really need to structure things differently going forward. I've got some ideas of how we could do that, but I can't continue working these hours that I'm not paid for. That's self-care. Real self-care is breaking up with the completely uncommitted guy that you've been seeing that you spend your whole life waiting for him to text and he's there and he's not and he's there and he's not and actually calling it and saying do you know what you're not in a place to be emotionally committed i get that i respect that i'm actually going to remove myself and i'm going to take myself elsewhere i wish you well that is self-care yeah you talk about it you talk about self-care it's actually really active and it's work and sometimes it's really hard and it's pretty much always doesn't look pretty. It's, it doesn't come with a pink bow on it. Real self-care looks like this. And I like this one you wrote down. Sitting down and making a spreadsheet of all your debts and figuring out some sort of payment plan that will start to release you from the crushing financial stress. That, my friend, is not sexy, but it is self-care. 100%. So yeah, see, it, that really is self-care, right? If you're in the spa and you're in the spa pool, but you're, it's sat in that spa pool going, I can't afford to be here. This is a nightmare. And then I can't even afford that thing next week. And how am I going to get the car repaired? Oh my God. But you're in a bubble pool. That's not really self-care, you know? It, and so I wrote a post on it just saying, look, we need to change the conversation around self-care. It's, it's, it, it, it's not just drink more water, have another bubble. That's it's survival and a nice thing to do. Let's up level the conversation around self-care. What really is up to us taking care of us and it is your financial spreadsheet you're exiting a really toxic relationship realigning your work boundaries whatever that is self-care and so i wrote this post on it that went just pretty viral and then i was like huh okay how about i take that because there was just such a response to it people saying thank god you've said this and I, this just so resonates yeah it's always lovely when something just really takes off and i was like okay how could i because I'm all about the implementing, <laughs> how can I help people actually implement that concept? If I'm saying this is what self-care isn't, let me say this is what it is in 101 really doable, not time consuming actions that you can tick off for yourself in like a tickable workbook. So we did it in, there's a digital one that you can tick it digitally or you can print it and be old school like me. I like doing things with a pen and underlining stuff. And so we broke it down, I broke it down into sort of seven areas. So it's people's physical well-being, their mental health, living space. If you hate where you live, it, it drags your mood, your mental energy, all those things down. Relationships, what do you need to clean up? Career, are you in an aligned place? Financial health, it's, it's such an enormous stressor. We Having 12 actions that are tiny and short, but that will help you clean up your financial health, helps your mental health, emotional health, everything. And playtime, hobbies and fun, because I don't know, you sound like you've got life pretty much in balance, but so many people do not. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't know. It's what this, some of the self-care things I did recently was email a bunch of authors that I said to come on the show to said, I, oh, sorry, I'm fully booked. I can't have you on the show anymore. Thanks very much. Maybe next season because I overbooked myself and I was overwhelmed and every podcast, I've got to read a few books and do a lot of research, it's a lot of work involved. So I overbooked myself. Number two, I had a 186 goals this year and I realized it's stupid. So I got it down to, got it <laughs> like 180 things that I thought I could do anyway. So I pushed them all to next year because that's just me. So now I've got a little list, a small little list there. And so now I'm not suffering from overwhelmed. I had really strong conversations with business partners of mine and said, Hey, I'm running thin on energy time. I can only do this day, that, that amount of projects, even though I've taken on more roles and responsibilities, but I've literally just trimmed up that and that's self care. So having those hard conversations, telling people no, cause a note saying a yes. So 
a yes to someone else is a no to you and saying no to someone else is a yes to you. And that was a big lesson I've learned recently. So instead of saying yes, because I'm a people pleaser, and I want to do things and hey, it's all great. I'm like, no, or not yet, or not now, uh, or just plain old, not really. No, or never. No. So that's been big. So a no to others is a yes to you, which is a good one. But yeah, that's my recent one that I've done. And it's my wife's into decluttering. She watches decluttering videos before she goes to bed and she's all about projects and decluttering, but that's her way of decompressing as well. Decluttering your life sometimes isn't about just moving the furniture around. It's about having hard conversations with others and also having a realistic look at your own schedule and saying, sometimes you put too much food on your plate and you need to just give it away. Yeah, 100%. I see those are, how many great examples did you just give there of genuine self-care? So I, I totally salute you. I'll just pick up on two of the things that you said. The 168 goals for the year. Oh, they were categorized into January, February, quarter two. They were, they were fully categorized on the spreadsheet, but that was causing me overwhelm because I didn't get through the January and February ones because big things changed that made those other ones wasn't important. I've had some big financial and career changes recently, which has been great. And sometimes you just got to put things off and put it into another spreadsheet and just move it across to next year or the year after or the decade after. Because yeah, anyway, continue. That was just, that was silly. Yeah, hundred percent. Because if you build no flex into that system and no space into that system, then, you know, you only need something extra to come up in life, which does happen. And then you feel behind and you feel overwhelmed and then you, there's no way you can catch up because you've overstuffed it in the first place. And so we just did in February in the academy, in my coaching academy, we did a process that I taught the ladies, a three, three step process, but we call it, it's called the conscious calendar. And so we set our conscious calendar for 2023. And it's a mu as much about what you are taking out and what you are parking as what you're putting in. It forces you to be really discerning and also to have that big picture of your year that you actually can get really excited about. Just go, yeah, this is what I'm going to put in my year, but I've also built in enough space that it feels exciting and not overwhelming and that there are things that will come up in life and there needs to be room for them. And there was, there was, a, there was something that came up in that module that just, it speaks so nicely to what you just said there about a no to others is a yes to you, which is such a powerful and important concept. And there's a quote by one of my heroine authors of all time, Elizabeth Gilbert, she of Eat, Pray, Fame, in incredible. I saw her speak in Auckland, oh my God, she was, I was such a fangirl, I was like in the second row. And there's a wonderful quote by Elizabeth Gilbert that speaks directly to this, which is, and I'm not doing it, you'd have to Google it, but essentially to paraphrase, life, we have so many opportunities in life these days that not being overwhelmed requires us not just to say no to stuff we don't want to do, it requires us to say no to stuff we do want to do. That's the nugget. That's, it's huge. Yeah, got it. That's what I, that's what I did. Yeah. I'm writing that down. So we, so yeah, we, I know you, you can Google and get the exact quote, but we did a lot of work on that in the conscious calendar. That was one of our big principles that we worked on and discussed for the month as we were putting everything, everyone does their own separate planner and working bees and all the rest of it. But it was like, if you want to feel how you want to feel at the end of the year, which is proud of yourself, excited, but also that you feel good in your body, you don't feel stressed, you don't feel overwhelmed, you feel peaceful, you feel on track, you feel accomplished. In order to do that, you have to say yes to actually quite a significant amount of things that you do want to do. That is life in 2023. We're fa fantastically fortunate to have so many opportunities available to us. And I think sort of 20, 30 years ago when we were teaching this stuff, it was like, say no to the stuff you don't want to do. I remember talking about that when I was first doing radio, so about 10 years ago, say no to the stuff you don't want to do. And I think life has moved on so much, it's now, it's next level. You've got to be really discerning about saying no to the stuff that you do want to do. You do want to do. It's funny you say that, right? So I used to wear my Google calendar as a, like a medal. So I'd show someone my calendar and be like, look how busy I am. And it would just be like, look what I did. 5 a.m. podcast, 10 p.m. podcast, 25 meetings in one day, in 15 minutes, get like crazy stuff. And they'd be like, one, they think you're doing really well, which, you know, you're busy. But now I look at my calendar right now and it's empty. 
and there's no better feeling than a blank calendar, a blank Google calendar. That's what now I'm looking at going, maybe I was wrong and trying to fit in so much stuff and the quantity was there. Great, fantastic, tick the quantity box, but was the quality there? And now I think a lot of people find it's all about quality time with your family, kids, partner, work, social life. It's not about the amount of times people will do things. It's really about the quality of, the, of that moment as well. And I think that's the real currency and it does come back to a high energy happiness. Having the right happiness level and energy when you're with people and doing things. I've been burnt out lately that I just, certain things in my business I've just let go because uh, there's no happiness or no energy there to do it. And maybe I just need to outsource that. And, and that's the other thing too, leaving room in your life for, I like that one. Moving on, we could go through the 101 self-care things, but we're going to definitely run out of time, which we've had. But number one, I just want to talk about the first one, which is simple, which is one, if people implemented this one thing, the other hundred ideas would just naturally fall through. You talk about schedule a self-care appointment. Talk to me about that. So, is this like number one in the book? <laughs> yeah, so life is busy, for sure. We're, uh, we are doing busy and important things all the time. Know what gets people, get gets what put off. Important but non-urgent self-care. Dentist appointments, man, going to the doctors, all that kind of stuff, but take action. Make one phone call right now, back it. Take five minutes, get it done. I thought you were talking about schedule a day, like a self-care appointment with yourself. What do you mean by that? That is, this is in the physical well-being section. And what I wanted to do was start this section off with something that people can do in two minutes so they feel good about taking action, right? So you look at the things that we put off and you see it all the time. It's putting off the mammogram. It's not comfortable. Nobody really wants to have one. So you put it off. It's putting off the pap test or the smear test. It's putting off the dentist because who likes going to the dentist? It's putting off your yearly blood pressure check and whatnot where they weigh you and you're like, oh no, a doctor's. Those little things we have a tendency to put, we'll do them for our pets and we'll do them for our children. If our children need to go to the doctor's or our, pet, our cat needs to go to the vet, my God, if the cat needs to go to the vet, I'm, I couldn't be on the phone quicker. My dog was choking in the middle of the night last night at 2 a.m. My wife woke me up. I had my hand down his throat, pulling out fake grass that he was choking on. True story. We will wake up for our dogs and kids. Continue. Is he okay? He's fine, yeah. I went back to bed. He's fine. It's disgusting though to wash my hands. Dog dad life. We all do it. We prioritize actually other people's physical well-being above our own and it is that old classic put your own oxygen mask on first and so i just want to start the book with something that everybody can achieve in two minutes or less is yeah do you know what i've just booked my dentist appointment i have just booked my mammogram not all of them just do one because the idea with the book you've got 101 ideas some are in your living space some are in your relationships some are in your career they can all be done in two minutes or less but you get that feeling of momentum because you've ticked one off and then you tick another one off so if you feel like a lot of people say they get the book and they say right for three months if you think about it, it's about three months worth of tiny tasks i'm going to do one each day for three months i'm just going to pick one some people are very methodical they go in exact order perfect and some people are like, oh, I like to dip into the other sections. And I know, even if I do nothing for myself the rest of the day, and I'm run ragged the rest of the day, I've done one tiny thing to move myself forward that day. And we just get so much feedback because you can tick it digitally. People love being able to see their progress. And it really is, I think, and this is the academy is structured around this as well, is when you give people too much to do and there's too many steps in it, we put it off and we don't do it. I remember once, it was a real pivotal moment in, just, in terms of when I was writing my book and structuring my book, there was this thing where it was fake seeing things like, this is the cheesecake that everyone's making, it's the healthiest cheesecake ever. And it had something like 26 ingredients. And will you bite, would you bake that? I would, who on earth has got time to do that? My wife's a cook, she would do it. My wife would do it. She's really good. She's got a cooking channel. Amazing. Oh, but generally, unless you've got your own cooking channel, you're not going to do a healthy action for yourself that requires you purchasing 26 ingredients and an 18-step recipe. Do you know what I mean? It's People will do things if it's done in a one or a two. And it's about that consistency. It's not about cooking a healthy cheesecake once every six months. 
it's a, it's about doing something tiny but good for yourself every single day and keeping that consciousness like top of mind about self-care and I guess it was back right to the story at the beginning because that's exactly what I didn't do I could have headed off everything that happened to me with two minutes five minutes of consciousness a day it would never have happened people think it's got to be this massive silver bullet I've got to work a four-day week or we've got to move to the country and then everything will be fine and those things are great and if you can make those things happen for yourself fantastic and I've had many clients that have awesome but for just starting where you are with what you have it's about two minutes of, of real conscious doable action for yourself on behalf of yourself each day and so that's what this book is about really it's about giving people something that's become self-motivating in itself does that make sense yeah absolutely absolutely some of the ones that stood out for me connect with a non-verbal creature love it like a dog or a cat one of the ones i want you to talk about so you're a yoga teacher back in 2004 long time ago you talk about yoga is it nidra or what is that well, yoga nidra nidra what is no yoga nidra oh my god i will send you a copy michael of my sleep fairy meditation okay we'll send you a link and we'll make it for free and you can send it to your people okay yoga nidra we were talking about sympathetic dominance and parasympathetic dominance in the nervous system yoga nidra is like an incredible ancient eastern wisdom instant reset to get you from sympathetic dominance to parasympathetic dominance in your nervous system it's like this secret source and so traditionally it's done at the end of a yoga class okay so people are all tired they've done all their asana work they lie down at the end they have what's called final relaxation now some yoga teachers just let it be quiet with maybe some music and then after two minutes they arm and that's the end of the class when i did my teacher training the style i was taught in does this very very energetically intense guided relaxation process that like i say it dumps you straight into parasympathetic dominance and you can literally feel like your, your face like all the muscles in your face relaxing and like slipping down and your whole body relaxing and when i taught yoga i was never the most bendy yoga teacher i was good at making people think they could do things they couldn't do and introducing people to yoga and but my so i was never the bendiest i was good enough to teach but what i was good at was that final relaxation and i would have people who would come to me and they'd be like i literally i come to class so that i can get like thursday night i sleep better than any other night in the week i hang out for that it is like i come twice a week purely for the final relaxation i've come to the yoga class to watch you finish the yoga class <laughs> that's funny yes so they're like i work really hard even if i don't want to because i want to get that feeling that i get at the end of class because i do not get it in my life at any other time it creates a completely unique sensation so it's a deep guided re relaxation technique based on obviously thousands of years of ancient wisdom but we've put it into an audio called the sleep fairy so that you can just listen to it to recharge in the day or really good when you're going to bed at night and so many people message and say i've got literally no idea how it ends i've got no clue awesome yeah i'll check that would, that'd be great i'll check it out i used to go for drives at lunch and just do a nap with guided meditation for half an hour just to recharge the batteries but that was because I was getting up at super early mornings to do podcasts and silly things and staying up late. So now I don't need to do that because of my energy levels are good. I think it's a good place to put a, a knot in it or a bookmark in it, so to speak. Where can people find you online? What's the website? Where do you hang out socially and where can they buy your books? So louisethompson.com, you can get the books on there. You can check out the coaching academy on there. Yeah, every, everything is on louisethompson.com and on Facebook, I'm Louise Thompson and Instagram, I think I'm Louise underscore Thompson underscore. I'll put it in the show notes. That's absolutely fine. Louise, thank you for sharing your story, writing the books, doing what you do, the wellness. What's the academy called again? Is it the Wellness Warriors? Is that right? Well-being, well-being warriors. Well-being warriors. Well-being warriors. 
Cool, cool. Thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. And to my audience, go out there, check Louise's stuff, buy her books, follow her socially, implement the wisdom, and get your energy levels and happiness under control and practice a little bit of self care. So enjoy the rest of your day. And I shall get some sleep because you're in the UK and I'm from Australia. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Louise. I'll speak to you soon. No worries. Thank you. Thanks.